Welcome back, BioMonsters. Today we're going to be talking about types of transport. Some things that we want you to remember when you're thinking about the new set of notes that you're about to listen to is what you already know about the cell. Having some understanding about those cellular structures will make today's topic a whole lot easier to understand. So before we actually talk about some new stuff, let's do a bit of review. So the first thing that we want to remind you of is that the cell membrane has a specific function. And here's a picture of the cell membrane. We know that this is the cell membrane because if you look, I have these, these circular heads and I have these tails. And if you remember, um, this head and tail structure is something called a phospholipid. And our cell membrane can also be called a uh, phospholipid bilayer because we have two layers of them. Now these structures in particular have a unique chemical behavior that allows the cell to control what enters as well as what leaves. This means that it's essentially the bodyguard of the cell. It can control what enters and leaves. Now because it's the bodyguard, there's another term that we can use to describe this. So we can say the job of the cell membrane is also to maintain something called homeostasis. And we've talked about homeostasis before. It means to maintain balance or stability. All right, so you want to keep that function of the cell membrane in mind as we continue on um, talking about our new information and talking about how things actually move into and out of the cell. Now, before we start talking about that, let's once again still focusing on the cell membrane. Again, we know that this is the cell membrane. The reason why we know it is because we have the same structure here, which is our phospholipid. We have two layers, so it's our phospholipid bilayer. We know that these um, areas behave differently. This area with the tails, these are our lipids, so this is a freight of water, so this is hydro phobic. And then our two head regions are going to behave the same way. They are polar, so they love water. So we're going to say that these guys are hydrophilic. And this is also hydrophilic because they're exactly the same. Now, looking at the structure, you'll also notice I have this big blob right here. And we've talked about this blob before. Um, uh, in a few lessons uh, back when we were talking about the cell membrane structure. Now this big blob is actually something called a protein. So if we were to look at our notes, it says the cell membrane is made up of mostly, well if we look at this picture, what do we mostly see? We mostly see these head and tail structures and we already said that those things are called phospholipids. But also they have these other globular structures that help to move things into and out of the cell. And that is going to be our proteins. So it also has proteins that aid in the transport of different things. And you want to remember that because some things do need a little bit of help. And if they need a little bit of help to move, we're going to rely on our proteins in order to do that. All right, so now let's focus on our big idea for this particular set of notes. Our big idea is to focus on this uh, notion that molecules like to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, which basically means that substances typically like to always be equal if they're separated in any fashion. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. If we look at this picture here, I have a container labeled A and I have a container labeled B. And there is going to be a passageway that connects these two containers to one another. First thing that I need to do to figure out how things might want to move is to go back and think about my big idea. I know things like to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. Well, one of the things that you're going to be asked to do is to figure out what is the concentration. Is it high or is it low? Now, sometimes it's tricky, and what we want you to pay attention to is how much stuff is packed into the space and how much space is around each one of those individual things. So if we look at space A, you'll notice that we have lots of these individual dots, and these dots, we'll go ahead and call them um, solute. That's the term we're going to use for the stuff that floats um, in a liquid. And we also have the same dots over here, so we're going to label this solute. But you'll notice in this container in A, we have a lot of these dots saw you and there's not a whole lot of free space but if we look over here at container B we still have some dots but look there's plenty of room around them so we could still pack tons and tons and tons of more solute into the space so this means we have a low concentration on side B and we have a high concentration on side A well, if the big idea is true and things always like to be equal, how can we equal out side A and side B? 
The only way to do that is to take stuff from the high concentration side, side A, and move it to side B. So this is how things want to move. They want to move from high to low. And we want you to remember that big idea as we start to apply it um, to new vocabulary terms. But before we do that, here's your first uh, stop and jot. Pause the video and raise your hand when you think you have the right answer so your instructor can come over and give you the okay to proceed. All right. The next thing that we want to talk about are what are the two basic types of transport? And the two basic types of transport that you need to know, um, the first one is going to be something called passive transport. And what I want you to do is focus on this word passive. If something is passive, it means that it doesn't have a lot of energy, is not really into movement, doesn't need a lot of, doesn't need a lot of uh, support to get going. So passive transport is the way that we move things into and out of a from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. And remember, go back and think about our main idea. Things always want to be equal, so things are going to move from a region of high to low. And this is going to happen, and this is key, without using energy. So we're not going to use any energy in order to do this. It's passive. Passive means no energy. Here are some examples. We have our picture here, a high concentration. Things are going to go from high to low. Here's another example with an actual cell membrane because this is what you're going to be seeing in biology class. We're moving from a high concentration to a region where we don't have a whole lot to a low concentration. And this requires, again, the key is no energy because things want to move this way because they want to become equal. So here's another way of thinking about it. We can think about passive transport as rolling a ball down a hill. So if you were to think about this, if we were to place a ball at the top of the hill and give it a little push, we don't really have to do anything else to get it to go from high to low. It happens automatically. Passive transport is just like that. Another way of thinking about passive transport is to say that passive transport is like a slide. If you go at the top, if you hang out up here on the top of the slide, you don't have to do a whole lot of work to get all the way here at the bottom because you are going from high to low. And the thing to remember is, is that this requires no energy. So no energy is the key for passive transport. And here's even another way of thinking about it. Passive transport, we could also say, is a lot like surfing. So as we're zooming out, we see that there's this guy on the surfboard and he's at the very top of the wave. So we're high here. And he's going to slowly make his way down to the bottom of the wave, low. But you'll notice that he's not really doing a whole lot of work. The surfboard is moving um, for him from the high part of the wave to the low part of the wave. So again, this is just like passive transport because we're going from high to low. And the key is we're doing that without any energy. All right. Now that we've talked about passive transport in general, we do want you to know that there are three specific types of passive transport that you all need to know. So we're going to talk about them briefly, and then we're going to talk about them in greater detail and give you some tools to help you figure out what type of transport is actually taking place, because that's what you're going to see on your quiz and also on your test. So our three types of passive transport are going to be diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Now they all have different names, but what we do need to remember is that regardless of what they're called, they're still all a form of passive transport, which means that there are some things that we automatically know they have in common. None of them require energy because that's one of the defining characteristics of passive transport. And we also know how things are going to move. They're always going to move from high too low, and we know that they're going to do this because that's the only way you can move if you're not actually giving energy to the system. The second type of transport that you guys are going to be responsible for knowing is something called active transport. And if you know what passive transport is, active transport is going to be simple because it's just the opposite. Now if you think about the word active, to be active requires a lot of energy. So this requires energy, which is the opposite of passive, which doesn't require any energy. On top of that, 
Uh, active transport is the transport of substances into and out of a cell from a region of low concentration. So we're starting out low and we're moving it to an area of high concentration. The only way we can go from low to high is if we give this system a lot of energy, so we require the use of energy. So here's an example. In here we have our low concentration and we are moving things up the concentration gradient to a region of high concentration. So we're no longer looking to be equal. Here's another example that's more relevant to our studies because it's actually a cell membrane. We have our transport proteins embedded inside of our cell membrane. And look, things are moving from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. The only way that we can do that is with energy. And if we look carefully at this picture, you'll notice you'll see something called ATP. ATP is sort of like gasoline for a car. Your car can't go anywhere without gasoline because that's what gives it its energy. Same thing is true in living systems. So our molecule of energy is going to be ATP. The easiest way to remember that is to use a chant. So what we always like to say is ATP energy. ATP energy. So active transport moves things from low to high. It takes a lot of energy to do that and our molecule of energy is going to be ATP. I'm going to write it quickly down here so that you can also write it on your notes. Now, here's some other ways of thinking about it. So previously, when we talked about passive transport, we said it was like rolling a ball down a hill. Well, remember, active transport is the opposite of passive. So active transport is like moving a ball from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. It requires a ton of energy because you have to push it the entire way. We can also say that active transport, unlike passive, where you start at the top of the slide and move to the bottom, in active transport, it's like trying to climb a slide from the bottom and go to the top. It takes a lot of energy to go from the bottom of the slide to the top of the slide, to go from low to high. Another example is what you're about to see. So when we talked about passive transport, we said passive transport was like riding away from the top to the bottom. No energy is required. But if you take a look at this video, you'll see that some salmon are helplessly trying to swim against the current. They're going from low to high. And while they're doing this, they're expending a ton of energy. So this is also really analogous to active transport. And unfortunately, many of these guys won't make it because it requires so much energy to swim against the current many of them actually die in the process of doing this. All right, here's your second stop and jot. Pause the video and answer the questions, and when you think you have the right answer, call your instructor over so that he or she can check to make sure that you have the right answers. All right, now that we've talked about the two basic types of transport, active and passive, what we want to do is spend some time talking about the subclasses of passive transport. So the first type of passive transport that we're going to talk about is something called diffusion. Sometimes it's referred to as simple diffusion. So if you see the word diffusion or simple diffusion, they mean the same thing. So the first thing that we want you to do is make a prediction. So we want you to look at the picture down here. Do you think that this is passive or active transport? The first thing that you want to do whenever you're trying to tackle a problem like this is look at the two opposite sides of the membrane and count up the molecules or the solute. So if I look on this side, I notice that I have a lot of the solute here, but I don't have a whole lot here. So I'm going to go ahead and write in what my concentration gradient is. So I'm high here and I'm low here. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the arrows. So my arrows are actually going from the region of high concentration to the region of low concentration. So I'm going from high to low, and I'm also looking to see if there's any input of energy. And I don't see any ATP in this picture, so I should know right away that this is a type of passive transport. And you should be thinking about all those things that we've talked about, going from high to low and no energy. Now, our definition of diffusion is written right here. So here's our textbook definition. It's the movement of small solute particles. That's important. It has to be small in order to scoot through this membrane from an area of high concentration, which makes sense. Here we go, to an area of low concentration down here without the use of energy. So we have some key terms here. So we have 
the word small. So that's a key word. I'm going to write that up here. I'm going from high to low, and I also know no energy. So these are all key things that I want to think about whenever I'm trying to entertain the notion of diffusion. So let's look at some key points again then. So what is actually moving in that picture? Think back to our definition. What's actually moving are things that are small. That's key. They have to be small to scoot through the cell membrane. Where are things moving? And if you look at that picture, you'll remember things are always going in that picture from high to low. If I'm going from high to low, it's like rolling a ball down a hill. It's like going down a slide, or it's like a surfer riding the top of the wave to the bottom of the wave. So the question is, do we need energy to do that? And the answer is no. The last key point that you want to look at for diffusion is um, brought to your attention by the last question. Does it need proteins? Well, if we go back and we look at the previous picture, you'll notice that there were no membrane proteins embedded in that picture of the cell membrane. So the answer is no. So those are our key points for diffusion. Here's an example of diffusion that you're about to see on the screen. We're going to have a little uh, beaker full of water, and in the middle of that beaker of water, we're going to place one drop of green food coloring. Now you're going to notice that over time, things are going to want to move from this high concentration here, and they're going to start to spread out in this direction. The reason why they're doing this is because, remember, things always want to be equal. So things are going to move from that high concentration to a region of low concentration. And when we speed this up, you'll notice it's going to continue to do it until it becomes equal throughout, which is one of the defining characteristics of passive transport. Here's the same example, only in a cartoon diagram. We have our uh, region of high concentration. So this is going to be high. This is our, our ink, our food coloring. Our concentration of that same solute is going to be low in the beaker. Once I drop it in, things are going to want to move from this area of high concentration to this area of low concentration. But you'll notice that we don't use any energy in order to do this. So it's still going to be passive. The next form of uh, passive transport that we're going to talk about is something called osmosis. So again, what we want you to do is make a prediction. Look at the picture. Do you think this is passive or active transport? And then we want you to be able to tell us why. Now this picture is tricky, so let's go ahead and take a look at it real quickly. Here's our membrane that's separating our two spaces. What we want to focus on is the net movement of water. Okay? So our water molecules are these little tiny guys here. And what we want to ask ourselves is where do we have a high concentration and where do we have a low concentration? Now this is tricky because we also have these other things that are embedded. And here's what you need to remember. The more solute you have, in theory, the less room for water. So that means the less solute you have, the more water you have. So if we're looking at the amount of water on this side, we notice that this side it's high, and over here, comparatively speaking, it's low. And if we look at the arrow, we'll notice that the net movement of water is going from left to right, so we're going from high to low. Well, if we're going from high to low, we know that this has to be passive, because going from high to low requires no energy. Now let's look at the textbook definition of osmosis. It's the movement of, and here's what we want to pay attention to, water. So this is the thing that's going to differentiate it from that diffusion term that we talked about earlier. Diffusion is just really small solute particles or molecules, and osmosis is only water. But we're moving things from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. And there's one more thing that we want to ask ourselves. Does it require energy? And we see here in the definition that it does not require any energy. So we're moving water and osmosis from high to low without the use of energy. Now to help us remember this definition, we can do some word art. So what we could do, we could put H2 and then O for osmosis to remember it's water, or we can simply turn that O at the very beginning into a water droplet to help us remember that osmosis is the movement of water. Now let's see if we can figure out what the key points are for this particular term. 
So the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is what is moving? And remember, if we do our word art and turn this into a water droplet, we know what's moving. It's going to be H2O or water. Now, where are things moving to and from? Well, if we look back at the picture and look at the net movement, we know things are moving from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. Well, if we're going from high to low, it's like going down a slide, rolling a ball down a hill, or starting at the top of the wave and surfing to the bottom. We know that it doesn't require any energy. So when it asks us, does it require energy, we're going to say an emphatic no. The last thing that we want to look for is whether or not any proteins were needed in order to move things from one side of the membrane to the other. And we didn't see any proteins in that picture helping water move, and we don't need that because water is pretty small, so we're going to say we don't need any proteins. So here are our key points for osmosis. It moves water from a region of high concentration to low concentration to become equal, which is one of the defining characteristics of passive transport. It does not require any energy, and for osmosis in particular, we're not using any membrane proteins. All right, here's your next stop and jot. Go ahead and pause the video. When you think you have the right answer, raise your hand so that your teacher can come over and check it for you. The last term that we're going to talk about is something called facilitated diffusion. Now for this term, we still want you to do the exact same thing. We want you to look at the picture and make a prediction. Is it passive or active transport? And then be able to tell us why. So let's go ahead and look at this picture. Now this picture has some things in common with some other pictures that we've seen. The first thing that we want to do is ask ourselves, what is the concentration gradient? So I'm going to look on either side and I notice over here I have a lot of solute and down here I don't have a whole lot. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in my concentration gradients in my picture. The next thing I'm going to do is ask myself, which way are things moving? So I'm going to look at the arrow. When I look at this arrow, I notice things are going from high to low, like going on a slide from top to bottom or rolling a ball down a hill. Where I know if I'm going from high to low, it has to be one type of transport. It has to be passive because when we go from high to low, it requires no energy. But if I continue looking at this picture, I notice that there's something unique here. We also have this guy right here. We have a protein, and we can just call it a transport protein, or we can call it a channel protein. Any of those terms work. And this is the first time we've seen this particular structure embedded in the cell membrane helping things move. So let's go ahead and look at the definition. The definition says that facilitated diffusion is the movement of, here's the first time we're seeing the word large, large molecules such as sugars and proteins from an area of high concentration, so we're starting high and we're moving it to an area of low concentration, like going down a slide, without again the use of energy, but we need a protein. So that's key. So facilitated diffusion is moving large things, but because they're really large, we need help. We need a protein, but we're still moving things from high to low. Now that term help is really important because if we look at this term facilitated, which is a really big word, facilitated is just a fancy way of saying help or to help. So my job as your teacher is to facilitate your understanding of biology or to help you understand biology. And for facilitated diffusion, it's a lot like the diffusion that we talked about before. We're still moving things from high to low, but because things are so large, we need help. And our helper in this case is going to be our proteins. So now that we've talked about the definition of facilitated diffusion and seen a picture, let's go ahead and fill in our key points. So the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is what is moving? And according to the definition, we know that very large things are moving. That's important. That's why we have this word facilitated, which means help. We need help moving those large guys from one side of the membrane to the other. Where are things moving to? Well, we know in that picture we still had a concentration gradient and things were still moving from high to low. And if things are moving from high to low, it's like rolling a ball down a hill, we know that we do not need any energy. The last question is, does it need a protein? Well, think about this. It's really large, so we need a lot of help. So we are going to need a protein in order to do this. So the answer is yes. 
Now here's a picture of facilitated diffusion as well. The reason why I know this is a picture of facilitated diffusion is because we have right away these things called channel proteins. Now these channel proteins are going to help to move large substances from one side of the membrane to the other. But the question is, how do I still know that this is passive transport? Well, I have to ask myself, what is the concentration gradient? So if I look on this side outside of the cell, we have a high concentration of solute, and on this side we have a low concentration. And if I pay attention to the direction of the arrow, I'll notice that my arrow is going from high to low, so that means no energy, so it has to be a form of passive transport, but it's passive transport that needs a helper, which is our protein, which means that it has to be facilitated diffusion. Here's a quick animation showing you what facilitated diffusion actually looks like along the cell membrane. Some proteins in a cell's membrane act as channels for specific ions or molecules. These channel proteins don't use energy at all. They simply allow the materials to naturally diffuse from the side with more solutes to the side with less. Whether the direction is out or in depends on where the concentration is higher for each different solute. So on this animation, you can see we have our cell membrane, but we also have these helpers, and these are our channel proteins. And if we need our channel proteins, but we're still moving from high to low, we know this has to be facilitated diffusion because we need the helper. And our helper are our channel proteins. All right, here's another stop and jot. Pause the video and answer the question. When you think you have the right answer, call your instructor over to have them check it out. All right, the last thing that we're gonna do is look at an actual example of active transport. We want you to do the same exact thing. Look at the picture. Do you think it's active or passive transport? And then tell us why. So let's go ahead and look at this picture. Now we're still gonna follow the same rules. The first thing that we're gonna ask ourselves is, where are things low and where are things high? So if I'm looking at this picture, I see here that we have a low concentration of solute, and on this side we have a high concentration of solute. The next thing that I'm gonna do is look for the direction the arrows are pointing in. Well, it looks like, according to this picture, that things are moving from high, or I'm sorry, from low to high. So we're pushing a ball up a hill or we're running up a slide. Um, and we know, we also see this molecule over here, this ATP, and we know that ATP equals energy. So if ATP equals energy, we know we're using energy. And by default, if we're going from low to high and we need energy, we know that this is active because energy is required. Now let's look at the textbook definition. Active transport is the movement of molecules, doesn't say anything about the type, it just says molecules, from an area of low concentration, that's new, low concentration to an area of high concentration, and we use energy. So we have to have energy in order to do this, but we also need proteins in order to pump them against their concentration gradient. So we're moving any type of molecule, it's not specified, from low to high. We need energy, ATP, energy, and we need protein pumps in order to help us pump them from one side of the membrane to the other. So let's see if we can come up with some of those key points. So the first question is, what's moving? Well, we said that we're just moving molecules. So we're just going to say any type slash size of molecule. It's not specific. Where are things moving? Well, here's where we're going to start to see some specifics that are unique to active transport. We're moving things from a low concentration to a high concentration. Whenever I'm going against the concentration gradient, I'm pushing the ball up the hill, I know I need a lot of energy, so the answer is going to be yes, and we're going to need lots of ATP, because ATP is energy for living things. The last question is, does it need a protein? Well, according to our last picture, we need a protein in order to pump stuff from one side of the membrane where it's low to the other side of the membrane where the concentration is high. So the answer is also yes. So active 
of transport, we've given you lots of analogies. Here's another one. Before we showed you salmon swimming against the current using a whole lot of energy. Here's another example. We have a buggy in a race going from the bottom of the sand dune, trying to get all the way to the top. So we're going from high, I'm sorry, we're going from low to high. And things to remember is that that requires a ton of energy. So here's your last stop and jot. Pause the video and answer the questions. When you think you have the right answer, call your instructor over um, to have them take a look at your responses.